Right, so, and then it's a great pleasure to announce the third talk by Javier. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm, <clears throat> sorry, uh, I'm going to start by uh, solving one of the many exercises I, I gave you yesterday. And this will give you give us an example of a, of a, of a period on a relative uh, cohomology group. So it was the case where you consider a GM, so the affine line minus the origin, and you take a cohomology relative to the two points, one and t. So t is a rational number. And <clears throat> to make things a bit easier, I'm going to suppose it's a it's a positive uh, rational number. And I, from now on, when I don't write any subindex, I mean that I'm considering at the same time uh, Betty and the RAM and uh, the comparison isomorphism and the mixed Hodge structure and and so on. So it is a so soon this symbol will mean the the motive of uh, GM relative to one and T. Okay, so let's see what it is. I'm, I'm going to start with uh, the RAM uh, cohomology. So this was it was the situation of a variety relative to one, a normal crossing divisor. In this case, it's very easy because it's just uh, two points. And you remember we we had to form this double complex with the with the, the RAM complex of uh, GM and then the RAM complex of the point. So so in this case, we can take uh, global sections everywhere. And what you get is if the coordinate here is called x. So here are the functions on GM. Here you have the differentials. Okay, so this sends a Laurent polynomial P to uh, P prime, dx. And now you 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 need to write the the complex of uh, the, the run complex of two points, which is just in degree zero and is constant uh, functions for each point. And here you have the evaluation map. So P will go to P of one, P of T. Okay, so we, <clears throat> then you take the total complex associated to this. So this will be in degree zero. This is in degree one. And in this case, you don't need to change signs. So the map is just the map on each factor. And we want to compute H1 of this. So H1, the RAM, of uh, GM 1T. So this is going to be the co-kernel of this map. I don't know. Delta. And uh, okay, so you, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exercise. You, you need to understand the image a little bit. So uh, clearly something that is going to be in the co-kernel is uh, dx over x, because you this, this one you can, can never get as a as a derivative. So this will be a class in the in the co-kernel. Is the one we already know from GM. And then you see that uh, to the, the, to to describe the image, you can you can try, for example, to see. Uh, so the the elements here mapping to zero are constant polynomials, and if you have a constant polynomial, then it will of course take the same value on one and t. So something that clearly is not in the image is, uh, for example, 0, 1, 1. Okay. And you can, you can play around a little bit with the complex and then see that this, this class is actually the same as the class of dx, t minus 1, 0, 0. Um, so this is, <clears throat> yes. This is the, the run complex of the points. So this is in, in, in yesterday's notation, this is O D one plus O D two. So these are the reducible components and the, the global sections are Q, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm saying that this element is not in the image of the map because if you if you map to zero here, it means it's a constant polynomial, and then it takes the same value on on the two points. 
and and oh, oh sorry 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 thank you <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i'm still uh, waking up sorry <laughs> Yeah, this is what I wanted to say. Uh, uh, yeah, and and then you you can show that this is the the same the same class as the at still one. So it was one of these examples of what I said yesterday that uh, you can represent top degree cohomology relative cohomology classes that just a form on on X. T minus one or uh, T T minus one. No, T is T. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 funny. You 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 get the you get this normalization, which, uh, well, as you see, will give the value one on on the period matrix. Okay. Okay. So you you need to take the difference of these two and see that it is the in the in the image of the of the map. Okay. So this is and 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 then the exercise is to show that this is a basis of 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 cohomology. Okay. And of course, you 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 find that it's weird that this is a cohomology class because this looks very exact. Uh, but it is exact if you consider the cohomology on GM, but it is not in the relative cohomology group because, for example, the integral from one to t of this form it is not zero. Okay, so so this is the new phenomenon that appears when you do relative cohomology. Okay, so this is the RAM, uh, and then uh, Betty. Uh, so Betty, we need to take the complex points. So C star, and then here is one, uh, and well, let's say T is here. And then you have two two cycles. So you have the usual loop around zero, which is the generator of uh, H1 um, homology of GM. But now you 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 can consider the 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 path from one to T, which will not be a, 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 an element in, in this homology, but has boundary containing one T and defines a class in this in this in this relative homology uh, group. So so this is this is a basis. So this will be a basis of uh, H1 Betty GM one T. And now if you compute the period metrics, then uh, you find so let's take here dx over t minus one and here dx over x here the circle so the integral is zero the integral here is two pi i and on the path <coughs> the integral here is one it's it's not surprising that you get one because if you if you work on this representation, the compaction isomorphism is given by evaluating the function on the point. So, so it's the same one you get here. And, and, and here you get the integral from one to t of the x over x, which is log t. Okay, so this is how you how you interpret uh, cohomologically uh, the, the logarithm of a rational number as a period. So, are there any any questions about this computation? Yes. Well, it's, I, I I assume this because I I want, just wanted to draw this straight uh, path. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise I will have to just to take a cycle, and that doesn't interfere too much with the with the circle. Nothing, nothing really changes. It's, it's, it's just for the for the draw. Exactly. Yeah. So this is. Uh, I'm I'm going to give some hint of how how would you do this exercise. So, uh, yeah. So remember, I, I gave you yesterday the long exact sequence for for relative uh, cohomology. And then this uh, was um, yeah. So you 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 have h one h one of GM. So then you will go to h one of the points, but this is zero. What comes before is h the the relative homology. 
And then uh, there was eight zero of the points and uh, eight zero of uh, GM. And then you will get an H minus one, which is, which is zero. Okay, so this is the exact sequence in this case. And uh, <clears throat> this is something we understand. So this is the second example of period I gave. So the period here was two pi i. Okay, so, so this is the, the same two pi i we, we find here. And if you, if you think in terms of what I explained yesterday, so uh, you will compute H1 of uh, GM as uh, H1 on, uh, well, you need to choose a compactification. In, in this case, it's P1. There's not much choice. And then consider the complex of logarithmic differentials. Okay. <clears throat> so this complex is, uh, is uh, omega P1 in degree zero. It's always uh, true. And in degree in degree one, well, you well, you can first start with this one. This is the this is O minus two because the X has a has a pole of order two at infinity. And when you take this uh, two points, so this will be O minus two plus two. So you get the trivial. <coughs> this is actually the trivial uh, bundle on 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 the line bundle on, on P1. So 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 this is actually the same thing as H0 of P1 uh, omega 1. And what is what is the form? So the form is dx over x. So this is this is the generator of this group because this has a, a, a simple pole at uh, zero. And if you do the, the change of variables, it also has a simple pole at infinity. Okay. <clears throat> so you see from the point of view of uh, Hodge theory, mixed Hodge theory yesterday, uh, this is not the first. Uh, this is not the first step in the in the filtration. So this is the second step because you have a, a you are allowing a pole. So this this one here is is omega uh, one, I guess, <clears throat> right? Uh, omega two. Yeah, thank you. So 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 this is omega two, and 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 it means that uh, this. Uh, is a uh, well. It's it, it, in this case, it's a pure hot structure, but it's not the one that uh, you would expect from H one because it has weight two. Okay, so and, and you see the you also see that uh, in in weight one it will be the image of the cohomology of P one, but the cohomology of P one is trivial, so you don't get anything there. So so this is this is actually as a hot structure or as a motive. This is what you call Q of minus one. And, and and here uh, for 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 each one of the points, so uh, you get the two copies of what you call Q zero. So meaning it's uh, one dimensional. The 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 hot type is zero zero. The periods are rational numbers. And 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 same here. <clears throat> and this map is uh, evaluating functions. So this is just the the diagonal map. Okay, so. All in all, what you get is that this this thing we are writing here is uh, an extension of uh, Q minus one by Q zero. Okay, so here the the period is two pi i. Here the period are rational numbers, and this is the things you see on the diagonal. And then you can you can do the the exercise that Georgie was uh, suggesting, and then see what are the, the the changes of basis that are allowed if you want to respect uh, this um, exact sequence of uh, hot structures. And then in that in in, in such a way, you will see that uh, this is actually a non-split extension. So non-split extension. Well, maybe at least uh, unless t is uh, maybe um, minus one. Well, t is yeah. t was different from one also. Okay, <clears throat> and this is this is something uh, new uh, with respect to Bruno's course, where the 
the, the typical Galois groups or the Manfortek groups were reductive because he was in the, the wall of pure hot structures. So here you actually take a, have an, an extension. And, and this means that the group, the motif Galois group later is going to be, a, so it's two by two. Uh, this tells you what you need to find in the diagonal of your group. So, so here Q0 has trivial Manfortek group. Q minus one, the, the group is uh, GM. So it means you, have, you will have matrices with one B, B is different from zero. Zero here. And then, well, there are only two groups like this. So either you have zero here, but this will mean that the extension is split or you, you can have anything here. So what you, what you find is actually this, this group of matrices, which is, well, either the, the affine group or a, a semi dial product of a GM or GA. And, 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 and this, this will be the motivic Galois group in this situation. <clears throat> and uh, last, uh, well, maybe two, two more comments. So uh, first comment is that in, in this period metrics, you see, for example, the monodromy of the logarithm, because I've, you know, I've, I've chosen a, a, a path. The logarithm is really, an, it's not an integral, uh, it's not a function of t, it's a function of t and a path from one to t. So if you change the path, the cohomology, the, the cohomology class is going to change <clears throat> by adding some multiple of the one around zero, and then you will see that it adds as many times this period. So, so the, the, the monodromy of the logarithm is contained in this period matrix. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to show you is, uh, you know uh, that the logarithm of A times B is logarithm of A plus logarithm of B. So this is now a relation between periods. So <clears throat> uh, if A, B are rational numbers. So the concept it's a conjecture tells you that you should be able to, to, to prove this relation using the three basic, uh, basic uh, relations, uh, additivity, change of variables, and, and Stokes formula. And, and this is how you do it. So let's start here. So this, this is H1 of GM 1AB. And then you integrate dx over x on the interval from one to AB. Okay, this is what I what I explained yesterday uh, in in the in the blackboard upstairs. Uh, and first, you can you can use uh, the the identity from GM to GM. So so this maps one AB to uh, I mean the, the image of so this is the identity map, and the image of one AB is contained in one A AB. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to do it bigger. So, yeah, so you consider the identity. And the identity sends uh, one uh, AB. The image is containing one AAB. Okay, so. So this means that you will have a, a, a map. So actually you, you use states on variables and this becomes the same thing as H1, GM, one, A, A, B. And then uh, DX over X and one, A, B. Okay, so <clears throat> The advantage is, is is something very stupid I'm doing. I'm just looking at my differential form and my cycle inside a cohomology group, which is a bit bigger because I added this, this, this point in the middle. The advantage is that now you can write this as uh, 1A plus 1, uh, but A, A, B. Okay. And then you can use add additivity. So the first relation in concept again. So then you will find the, 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 the period for 1A, and then you do this operation back, and then you find that this is H1 GM 
one a dx over x one a okay, so this is the the first part and well what are you going to do on the second part you are going to do a change of variable so so now you use the map <coughs> f from gm to gm that is multiplication by by a and multiplication by a sends uh, <clears throat> one b to uh, a a b the differential form is invariant and then the cycle uh, a a b will be the image of one b so this is the same thing as h1 of uh, gm one b dx over x one b okay and now here this is the logarithm of a and then this is the logarithm of B. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, what I'm just doing is a very complicated reinterpretation of the change of variables you do to, to, to prove this in, 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 in a first calculus uh, year. Okay, <laughs> any questions? So now the, the, the next goal is to uh, construct the motivic Gallo group. <clears throat> and then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give you an exercise. So the exercise is to compute H1 of uh, uh, affine plane minus <clears throat> the, um, the curve defined by the equation one minus alpha x y equals to zero. So alpha here is, an, uh, is a rational number is, which is not equal to one. And relative to the union of the lines uh, x equals to one, x equal to zero, x equals to one. Uh, I, I I want H2. Maybe maybe I said H1. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> compute this uh, this relative commodity group. Okay, so the reason you 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 want to do this is because among uh, all the periods, so, so it has dimension three, and one of the periods you will find if you do this, so you can integrate on the square. This is why I put this boundary. So you find the integral on zero one square of dx dy over one minus alpha xi, okay? <clears throat> and this integral is equal to the dilogarithm of alpha. So this is a way to, 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 re, to realize this as a, as a period. And then the, you, can, you can keep going on the exercise and then see uh, what happens if alpha is equal to one? Well, I will tell you what happens, <laughs> which is that if alpha is equal to one, this is uh, the line x y equals to one, and 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 it will pass through this point. Okay, and then this creates quite a mess in the computation of the period. So you need to start doing blowing blowing ups, and because you you cannot integrate on. On, 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 the, on the square here, if the boundary touches a point which is not in the space. Okay. And it's somehow very important phenomenon in the, in the study of periods. Okay, any, any questions? No, th this was in multiplication by A. This map is multiplication by A. So, so recall, uh, we have this relation. Okay, so if you, if you apply this to omega is equal to dx over x, 
Well, this is invariant under uh, multiplication by A. And if you take sigma is 1B, when you multiply by A, you will get AAB. This one, this F here is the identity. I'm 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 using the same letter F for two different things. So it's, you you can call it G if you want. <laughs> yeah, good. And then this is F one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so. <clears throat> Let me now. I want to construct uh, this uh, motivic Gallo group, and there are there are two two approaches to to do it, uh, which are completely different. And yes, uh, here, yeah, this is called the D logarithm. So it's um. <clears throat> but it's, 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 you know, so it's, it's defined by, this power series. Okay. So if you take the value at set equals to one, it gives the, the, the Riemann zeta function at two. Okay. So. Yeah, I was saying there are two very different approaches to construct the motivic Gallo group. One is by Nori, the other one is by Ayub. And, and, and we know that they, they give rise to the same group. So uh, today I will try to explain how, how Nori does because it is the simplest uh, construction. And, and maybe how can you how you can reinterpret uh, the Konsevitsagie conjecture and the Grotendieck period conjecture in terms of this construction. Okay, so Nori is category of motives. So there are two, two ingredients uh, in the construction. So the, the first one is very formal and it's still, for me, it's uh, some kind of miracle that you can do something with uh, such, a, such a formal construction. And it's it's a way to attach an abelian category to a, to a quiver representation. So I'm going to start with a quiver representation. So a quiver here means an oriented an oriented graph. So maybe something or something like this, for example. Okay. So you should you should think the well you, you should think of a quiver as a as a category without composition law. So you simply have uh, mo objects. Objects are the the vertices of the quiver, and you have morphisms. Which are the arrows, but you you don't have a composition law between morphisms. Okay, and um, so we are a quiver is said to be finite if there is a finite number of uh, vertices and, and arrows. Okay, that's a quiver, and then what's a, what's a quiver representation? So if this was a category, you would say a functor to vector spaces, where it's simply the assignment of a vector space for each uh, vertices, uh, for each vertex in the, in the quiver and on a, of an endomorphism of the corresponding vector spaces for, for the arrows. Okay. <clears throat> And if you have um, such a representation, you can construct the endomorphisms of rho. So this is going to be a Q algebra. 
as follows. So, so first, if q is finite, well, what are the endomorphisms? It's simply a, a collection of endomorphisms of each of the vector spaces associated to, to a vertex, uh, which are compatible with the with the arrow. So is the is the obvious thing. So you have a collection of endomorphisms of the vector spaces. And they commute with morphisms. So here you have EQ. And now if you have a morphism from Q to Q prime, this thing will commute. And in general, what you do is uh, you, you filter your quiver by finite subquivers, and then you write the endomorphisms so this is a limit over finite subquivers that you order by inclusion. And then you consider the endomorphisms of rho restricted to each of these finite subquivers. Okay, so this is still a this is still a Q algebra. But now it, it has a it has a the structure of a pro. So when you when you write it as these limits, so this is actually a pro Q algebra of finite type, meaning a, a projective limit of Q algebras of finite type. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, once you have the the endomorphisms, you define a category Q uh, row as the category of Q vector spaces of finite dimension together with a continuous action of uh, the endomorphisms of Rho. So continuous here means that if you have a vector space V, so uh, an action of the endomorphisms of rho is a linear map from N rho to N the endomorphisms of V. And you want that each uh, such action factors through a finite subquiver. Okay. So this is, yes? But it's a, you should put a parenthesis here maybe. <laughs> so pro Q, it's a projective limit of Q algebra of finite type. Um, yeah, so this is an abelian category. Very, very concretely, the objects are uh, a vector space V, a finite subquiver Q0, and a linear map from the endomorphisms of uh, rho restricted to Q0 to the endomorphisms of V. Okay. And well, what, what Nori proves is that this, uh, this construction is uh, universal for Every, everything that can be compared to, to the representation. So, yeah, yeah. So, you, these are the identifications coming from, uh, from uh, restriction maps and inclusions in the, in the algebra. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying all these objects are different. Yeah, so 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 Nori Nori proves its universal property that that says the following. So you you have here your quiver, the representation. Here's the category we constructed. 
Uh, so this uh, vector space is plus something. So you have the forgetful functor. Here you have a canonical lift of the of the representation that is given simply. So you need to say what is that uh, what 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 is this does on an object Q. So this is the vector space row of Q. The quiver consisting of Q with the identity, and the identity map from the from the endomorphisms of here to the endomorphisms of, of B. Okay, so we have this, and then the universal property says that if you have A, which is a, a, a Q linear abelian uh, category, you have a map uh, from uh, Q to, to A, and here you have something that looks like a forgetful factor, so this means uh, Q linear exact faithful factor. And you know that the, everything commutes. So then there's a, there's a unique, uh, unique isomorphism up to unique isomorphism map that makes the whole thing commute. Okay. So it's in, in this sense that this construction is universal. And then as, as so you can imagine this. Uh, so the, the category of motifs is going to be constructed like this. And you can imagine that this property is very useful to construct the uh, realization factors. So, so we are going to construct it using Betty homology, but uh, you you construct uh, the RAM uh, realization factor, for example, using this this universal property. Okay, that's the general construction. So, uh, in our case, so now I need to give you a quiver and a representation, and yes. Yeah, thank you. So I'm I'm assuming this, yeah. Uh, which is uh, which is a weird thing for quiver people to to do, but in 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 this situation, it's very very useful to 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 set up the theory. I'm I'm assuming that in my quiver, every every vertex comes with an identity. Yeah, so this means there's uh, still no composition, but I have an identity morphism for every object. <laughs> ah, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe that's another way to to do that. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's it, there's a there's a functor that makes the the thing commute. No, no, I, there's there's a uniqueness property of this functor that you well, it's a bit uh, tricky to formulate, I think, but I, I'm just saying it's a, it's a functor between the two categories. I, I I can try to do this exercise, but maybe not uh, now. Now it, it's it's quite uh, the, the, it's quite uh, hard to compute uh, explicitly the category, but uh, I I'll, I'll I'll try to give some examples of uh, easy quivers where you where you see what happens. Okay, so in in, in our case, we are going to to consider a quiver uh, Q of K, where the uh, objects. So now you are not going to be surprised by what I will do. So the, the objects are symbols X, Y, and I. So X is a, is a variety. Well, the situation is as, as usual, so K is a subfield of the complex numbers. So X is a variety, Y is a closed sub-variety. I don't need to put any assumptions because I'm going to use Betty homology. So 
uh, and 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 in our in an I integers. So you should think of this as a cohomological degree and this as a Tate uh, twist. Okay, so these are the the objects. So this will be the the vertices of the quiver. So you you, you see it's uh, quite a big quiver. 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 Uh, yeah, everything over K. Thank you. And then there are there are three kind of morphisms. So first one, if you have a, a map from X to X prime that sends Y to Y prime, then you get a pullback morphism. Okay, so this is one type of morphisms you put in the quiver. Second type, <clears throat> if you have set inside y inside x then you have a boundary map it goes from cohomology of y relative to z in degree n minus one to x y and i so you see here we are keeping n and i here we are uh, moving the cohomological degree by a boundary morphism and now there's a third type of <clears throat> morphism that uh, well take care, takes care of the of the twist so and so it takes the following form essentially uh, you do you do a product with h1 of gm and you want to 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 know that this uh, well that this is like the tape twist but for, for a reason that will become clear later, it's better to work with H1 of GM relative to one. Okay, so H1 of GM has cohomology in degree zero and one. If you do relative to a point, it only has cohomology in degree one. And this makes things easier. So, so, so what I'm going to write here is the product of two relative cohomology groups. This is why it's a bit more complicated. And then m plus one, i plus one. And then there's a map to x, y, and i. <clears throat> okay, so that's the quiver. I, I've told you what are the, the vertices and what are the, the arrows. And then what's the representation? as formal as the others so uh, yeah, yeah for the moment i'm just giving some symbols and and and, and relations between them so uh, now when when you see the representation i will tell you what uh, the where the first the first morphism goes to the second and and you you will see what we are doing here Okay, so this uh, goes to vector spaces over Q, and what is it? So X, Y, and I. No surprise, this goes to cohomology in degree N of complex points of X relative to Y with rational coefficients. And then uh, Tate twist, which as we saw in uh, Johann's lecture, so this is tensor by H1 of gm relative to one to the power i and if the power is negative it means the dual okay so this is what it does on on, on objects so morphisms of type one are sent to a functoriality of uh, morphisms in, in in relative cohomology this is the this is the boundary map in the in the long exact sequence associated to uh, triples and then this goes to an isomorphism if you compute the QNET. Uh, so what you need to compute is the cohomology of, uh, not going to write it again, but this thing here. So by, by QNET, this is going to be the, the tensor product of cohomology of X, Y, and the cohomology of GM1. <clears throat> so it's, it's an isomorphism in this case, and then you map 
the, the morphism of type three to, to, to this isomorphism, okay. which is uh, something a bit tautological that is telling you that the type twist is given by, it's telling you that this I in the, in the, in the symbols really corresponds to the type twist. Okay, so that's the quiver. And then if you, so maybe I call it raw Betty. And if you apply this construction to this quiver and this representation, you find <clears throat> an abelian category. And this is the category of Nori motifs. Okay, that's, yes. Uh, this is the QNET formula. Yeah. Okay, it's the QNET formula in relative cohomology plus the fact that, as I said, this uh, GM relative to one only has cohomology in degree one. Okay. So actually, you want to be a, uh, more precise, cohomology in degree n plus one of this is cohomology in degree n times h1. Um, yeah, the point is that I want to have duals in the in the category. So if you do a construction like in the style of uh, maybe Grotendieck, so you first define effective motives, and and then you realize that. Uh, for example, H, H1 of a GM is not invertible in the category. So you, you formally add the, the, the inverse. Uh, so here I'm putting them from the beginning. That's the, yeah. So <clears throat> if, I, if, I, if I didn't care about duals, but then I, I'm trying to, to get a Tanakian category, so I need duals. And, and this is the role of, of I. Yes? Yeah, this is one of the points of the theory. Uh, no, it's 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 you you use Poincaré duality, so you so Poincaré duality in the easiest case. So uh, so so what it is in the easiest case is H X smooth projective. Then uh, you have a you have a pairing. like this. So this is a Q uh, minus D. And this, uh, this tells you essentially that these two objects are dual to each other, except that you need to take this into account. So, so the, once you know how to invert this, you, you can do a smooth projective varieties. And then for, for, for these relative pairs, it's, it's more complicated, but uh, it's still the same idea that once you know how to invert the GM, you, you can do everything. Okay, so that's, that's the first ingredient. So this is the formal aspect of the construction that works for every quiver. And then uh, there is a geometric aspect of the construction, which goes into the proof that uh, this is actually a Tanakian category. Here I am. Uh, MK uh, is endowed with a tensor product. Compatible with the QNET formula. Compatible with the QNET formula, another way to say the same thing is that, uh, so here you have a tensor product of vector spaces, and once you have the tensor product on the category, this will become a, a tensor factor. Uh, in uh, um, that turns it into a Tanakian category.
and the the upshot of uh, this will be that mk is equivalent to the category of finite dimensional representations of some affine group scheme over q this is an affine group scheme over q and this is what will be called the motivic Gallo group Uh, it's it's so it's an affine group scheme and it's 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 a pro algebraic. Uh, so so here I'm not asking finite type. So it's a pro algebraic uh, uh, group over Q. And this is this is quite a wild uh, object. So for example, one quotient of this object will be the Galois group of uh, K bar over K. But if now you have M, an object of MK, so the the only the only common feature of all approaches to motifs is that a motif is an object of a category of motifs. So, so 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 this is what we we'll call a motif. Then you can you can consider the the Tanakian category generated by it. So it's the smallest. A Tanakian subcategory that contains M. And then this, by the general theory, this will also be the representation of some group. But now this group is, uh, is much more manageable. So it's, a, it's an algebraic group and it's a subgroup of um, the, the Betty cohomology of, of M. Okay, so for example, if M is HNXY, so then this will be a subgroup of uh, GLN of H, Betty, and X, Y. Okay. <clears throat> and in some sense, this, this, this group is the limit of all these GMs as, as M goes through all motives. Okay. And, and, and then this is, well, in the, in the case, uh, M is the cohomology of a, of a smooth projective variety. This is supposed to be the Manforte group. And for the for the example I was giving of the logarithm, it is the um, <clears throat> the affine group. Okay, so maybe just five minutes, perfect. Uh, that uh, it relies on some form of the Hodge conjecture. So the the Manforte group is is constructed using Hodge theory. So this this one is constructed using well. Yes, singular cohomology. And if you know at least some weak form of the Hodge conjecture, you, you know that the two are the same. We know that they are the same for abelian varieties, for example, even if we don't know the, the full conjecture. Okay, so just give you an idea of what's the geometry that goes into this. Uh, so yeah, we want, we want to define a tensor product and there's only one reasonable thing to do, which is, X, Y, and I tensor product with X prime, Y prime, N prime, I prime. So it is X times X prime. And then relative to X times Y prime union Y times X prime. And then you do the sum of the integers, the degrees and the, and the tape twist. But this is not compatible with the QNET formula. Because when you when you compute the cohomology in degree n plus m prime, so you okay, you, you have the contributions in degree n and the contributions in degree n prime, but you also have many other contributions. So, so this will be a sum over integers a plus b equals to n plus n prime of uh, cohomology in degree a times cohomology in degree b. Yes, yeah, so yes. Which this one? Geometry. 
I, I'm trying to explain the geometric ingredients that go into into this this, this theorem. Yes, exactly. And then I said that uh, the only reasonable thing to do is to define the tensor product like this. But this is not compatible with the QNET formula because in general, there's cohomology in, in many degrees. So when is it compatible with the QNET formula? When there's only cohomology in one degree. Okay, so the... <clears throat> This, this gives you an idea of what to do. So you are going to restrict yourself to the case where there is cohomology in one degree. So you consider a subquiver. So this C stands for cellular. And these are the objects X, Y, and I with two properties. So X is affine. And uh, the cohomology vanishes if P is different from N. Okay. <clears throat> and then the statement is that you 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 can restrict the, the quiver representation to this subquiver. Because this construction is very functorial, so this gives you a map from the corresponding categories. And then the, the, the theorem is that this map is an equivalence. <clears throat> and then here you define the tensor product by this formula because then it will work. And through the, the equivalence, you get it on the whole category. OK, so what do you need to, to, to prove this? So two ingredients. First is uh, that you can restrict to affine varieties. This is something I already mentioned in the first lecture. So this is Joan Ulu's trick. That says that if you have any quasi-projective variety, you can find a, an affine variety and a map to it, to the original variety whose fibers are affine spaces. So this map will induce a, a, an isomorphism in cohomology. So this is affine. And then this is the content of a very beautiful, um, well, lemma <laughs> by Nori and Bailinson, which is called the basic lemma. And it is the analog of cellular. This is why I call this cellular. So it's the analog of cellular filtrations in topology. So you have a topological space. You can, you can consider a filtration uh, by uh, subspaces in such a way that the cohomology of each uh, space relative to the previous one is concentrated in a single degree doing cells. And, 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 and then out of this, you, you, you construct a complex that computes the cohomology of the whole space. So the basic lemma uh, says that you can do this in algebraic uh, geometry. So you can, and uh, it's, it's important that the varieties is affine because you are going to get the vanishing above the dimension by cohomological dimension and the vanishing below using, using this, this thing. Okay, and it's probably time to stop, so thank you. Questions? So you have uh, the first part is kind of formal. You have this, uh, I mean, this result of Norris that there is this enrichment. Mm -hmm. But uh, is there uh, a similar result for Tanakan enrichment directly? I think maybe some hypothesis. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's not very clear to me. Um, no, it's, that it's, could be a purely formal other uh, construction, and then you have to prove that the two coincide, and this would be exactly the content of the lemma. Yeah, it, it, it's possible that something like this happens. I, I really don't know. So, 
there are there are many many variants of the of the general formalism where well instead of going to vector spaces you go to other to other things but i i don't know any situation where you would you get Tanakian directly? I think about it. You have a question? Yeah. Sorry, I got a bit lost in the end. Can you explain this construction again? Um, so what, the, do you, what do you do with the cellular guy? I mean, what do you do then? Yeah, so, well, uh, it, it's, it's normal because I didn't give any details. So I'm, 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 what, I, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, you, if you restrict yourself to 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 these objects, so X affine and cohomology only degree uh, n, then uh, you 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 get a priori a, a smaller category, but you can prove that it is equivalent, and on this category the tensor product works. Okay, this uh, okay. I was confused by this green tensor. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, because the 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 abstraction for for tensor was uh, that there are cohomology in, in various degrees. Thanks. And uh, so, sorry, how, how do you get the uh, so, so you on on this uh, subcategory the tensor product works and then you you extend to to the whole category how? Yeah. So <clears throat> so if you do if you do this uh, cellular filtration business, so what you what you find is that uh, every object here is the cohomology, so everything is an abelian category, so you can you can consider complexes and take cohomology. So every object here is going to be the cohomology of a complex here. I see. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, you're saying. But the, the cohomology means just a sub quotient. So so you 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 can you can identify objects here with objects here through this very explicit construction and then take the tensor product. I see. And uh, sorry, one more question I had is, uh, so when you when you get this Tanakian category, um, so so I assume you um, when you for to get this uh, to get the fiber functor, you fix probably some some base point or some base object, like uh, like thing to to get the yeah. The, this is I I I didn't say what the fiber functor was. So the this, the fiber functor is the Betty is the representation of the quiver. So I'm I'm constructing the category using the quiver uh, representation given by Betty cohomology. Okay, and, and then uh, here is MK. And then the, 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 the fiber factor is just the forgetful factor in, in, in this construction. I see. Uh, is, is there a way to, to do this construction without uh, privileging uh, Betty cohomology over over all the other cohomology functors, like could you get something like Motivagawa groupoid? Groupoid? I, I don't know if this question makes any sense. Like I'm, I'm, I'm saying like if you don't fix a base point, can you get a groupoid instead of a group somehow? Well, you can, you can, um, you can consider all fiber functors at the same time, and then uh, so this is this is something important for tomorrow. So uh, I, here I have a Betty Betty fiber factor. There is also the Ram one. And and you can consider the the isomorphisms between these these functors. So so this will be the analog in topology of instead of considering the fundamental group base at some point, you consider paths from one point to another. And you can do this for any five, two pairs of fiber functors. You can consider all of them at the same time if you want. And and, and does this, it does it give you a group point instead if you consider all of them at the same time? Yeah. Nice. And. We, we will just consider two of them, so Betty and the Ram. And when you compare them, you will get a torsor under this multiplicial group. We have some more questions. Okay. Many questions. Don't forget, we have uh, to drink coffee also. Yeah, so just uh, is there some, can you give an example where you can compute the motivic Galois group explicitly? Is it possible? I I already gave two examples uh, secretly. So, so one of them was, um, uh, 
I would like to say this at the same time, very computable and not computable at all. So <laughs> let me let me try to argue the first point of view. So uh, yeah, so if you if you have q q of um, q of uh, minus n, for example. <clears throat> So, so the, the cohomology is of dimension one. So what you find is a subgroup of uh, GL1. And there, there are only two kinds of algebraic subgroups. So either the whole thing or a, a group of uh, roots of unity. Okay. So how do you distinguish these two things? So, well, here, if you do tensor power to the nth power, then you get the trivial object. Okay. So what you need to is not the same n, of course. So what you need to do is to consider the, the tensor powers. Okay. L. And, 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 and if you do this tensor power, because you have a theory of weights, then you get minus N L. Okay. So the, the only way this is zero is that N is zero. So, so the motif Galois group of this thing is uh, GM. So GL one, if N is different from zero or, um, or, or just the trivial group if n is equal to zero. So for n equals to one, this was the case of pi of two pi i. So the p of two pi i has group uh, GL1. So, thanks. Thank you. We have some coffee. So let's <laughs> stop now. Thank you very much for the talk. Yeah. Did with Q square is big in this very precise sense that when you count the points of height smaller than t, you have at least, for instance, polynomial, such, polynomial many, many such points. So if this guy is big, then c is algebraic. OK, which is a crazy theorem, I think, because it's very powerful and goes exactly in the opposite direction of usual algebraic geometry, where when you do diophantine geometry, you start with something algebraic, and then you are interested in counting rational points. Here, yeah, you just do a naive count inside Rn, and you get this. Okay, so this, this result is due to uh, Bombieri and Pila. And then it was generalized. It took a lot of time to really understand what happens in higher dimension, that you have to take this union of all uh, positive dimensional algebraic subsets. But uh, so this is a, a marvelous theorem. So this is the first kind of algebraization, uh, which is really uh, useful. And hopefully, uh, we'll see uh, one application at the end of this lecture. Uh, the second is uh, uh, what happens when you play uh, minimal geometry against complex analysis. Right, because uh, when you start studying complex analysis, you know that it's full of pathologies, uh, like essential singularities. And the motto is that, uh, of course, if you have something tame, uh, such singularities should not appear. So the motto is that all the pathologies of complex analysis uh, are incompatible, are not compatible. So the pathologies are not compatible with tame geometry. So this is vague. Uh, let me give uh, a, an example, uh, which is in dimension one. First example, as I said, are essential singularities. So suppose, let's look at the following lemma. Suppose you have a function from uh, the punctured disk uh, to C. So uh, C analytic. And now suppose that it is not only C analytic. So of course, if you are in such a setting, you can have an essential singularity at zero. All right, so uh, let's suppose now that this function is definable in some so minimal structure, which means that I'm I secretly identifying this guy with R2. I'm forgetting that this map is complex analytic and this uh, punctured disk, of course, is definable. I mean, it's given it's semi-algebraic. And the result is that then F has no essential singularity. It is meromorphic. And the proof, well, it's not trivial. It's easy uh, once you uh, 
you know, a bit of complex analysis, namely uh, this follows immediately from a uh, great Picard theorem. Otherwise, uh, suppose you have an essential singularities and the great Picard theorem tells you that the closure, is there any question here? In some or minimal structure, whatever the one you want. And then it's meromorphic, yeah. So uh, otherwise, uh, the closure of the graph of that uh, function, or even the boundary, well, by the great Picard theorem, uh, it contains zero cross C. You take all the values. So this is great Picard. But now you see that this is a contradiction because the dimension of that boundary then uh, is, a, is two, which is the same thing as the dimension of the graph. And we know this is not possible. We know that this is not uh, possible for a definable function because we have a stratification theory there as I explained yesterday. This is a contradiction to definability in some or minimal structure. Yeah. So by the great Picard theorem, you know that if you look at the closure of the graph of F, because there is an essential singularity at zero, then the, uh, you will have this in the closure. So it will be in the boundary. But then this means that the boundary has dimension two, real dimension two, because you have C, okay? Which is the same thing as the dimension of the graph, because I'm, uh, this is the image of delta star, okay? And so this is a contradiction because if your map is definable, you know that this, this closure has to be definable and the boundary has to have strictly smaller dimension uh, than uh, the graph itself, okay? So this is a contradiction to minimality. So you see that uh, this is a typical kind of thing which can be very useful. So now let me explain what happens in higher dimension. So in higher dimension, maybe I want to clean this better. Uh, in higher dimension, uh, the following problem is uh, classical. So you start with S, let's say, a complex analytic manifold. So here I'm assuming a smooth. And then you remove some complex analytic set closed. So closed C analytic subset. And now uh, you suppose that uh, inside this uh, open guy, you have a, a C analytic irreducible subset. And then uh, you would like to understand what is the closure in S of that guy. Does it have any uh, natural complex analytic structure? And of course, the answer usually is no, right? Just look at the graph of the complex exponential. If you take the graph of the complex exponential in C square, take the closure in P2, and you see that this is horrible at infinity, okay? So you don't have any, uh, the closure has no complex analytic structure at all. But uh, uh, there is a following theorem that tells you that uh, you need some tameness assumption. And the tameness assumption is basically that the dimension of X has to be larger strictly than the dimension of E, right? Which is not the case of the example I gave where uh, the boundary was dimension one and the graph was dimension one. Uh, but if you are in this situation, X is sufficiently big, then actually uh, as a closure is complex analytic, complex analytic grows through the boundary, then X bar inside S is complex analytic of the same dimension as X. So this is a famous result of uh, Remert and Stein in the 60s. Uh, No, but uh, you're right that uh, you can use this result to uh, to prove uh, uh, Chow theorem. Um, now, uh, the claim is that there is a much nicer, in some sense, uh, definable statement, 
which is the following. Suppose that X, uh, S is a, a definable in some minimal structure. E can be any complex analytic subset, I don't care. And now assume that X is also definable. Okay, and then you can remove this. And the statement is still true. Well, the proof can be uh, given in two words. Uh, you apply the decomposition theorem and Bishop theorem, if you know what it is. So Bishop theorem tells you that if you look at the k-dimensional volume of a complex analytic set of the dimension k over two, uh, then if it grows, uh, it, it, uh, uh, if you are al algebraic, basically uh, um, uh, you are algebraic if this volume remains bounded near the boundary. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing. And the corollary of this, so I'm lost in my pages. The corollary of this, uh, yes, let's do it this way. Uh, the corollary of this is, of course, the following uh, version of the Chow, Chow theorem. So this is O minimal Chow. Suppose uh, that uh, you have a complex. First, you start with a, uh, uh, an algebraic variety. Uh, so S is algebraic, and you identify it. And so you suppose, so we can think you will not lose anything in generality, assuming that S is a n or a c, so the, uh, a fine space. And you suppose that you have some guy which is C analytic here. Yeah. Now let's assume it is definable in some O minimal structure. Then it is algebraic. So this is uh, a version of Chow theorem, but you are not assuming that the ambient space is projective. What you are assuming is some tameness at infinity of X. Okay. So I think this is a remarkable algebraization result. Um, and this follows rather easily from uh, this uh, result, uh, just copying the classical proof of Chao theorem. So uh, you can try to do that as an exercise. So uh, as I tried to uh, explain, uh, this Omnium LD business is really uh, nice for algebraic geometry because of this kind of algebraization result. So let me uh, show you how you can apply this. Um, well, the first thing that you get out of the theorem of tameness of uh, period maps is uh, the following uh, new proof, or maybe easier proof. Of course, I'm assuming now this result uh, of the Catani de Kaplan theorem. Right, so what was the Catani de Kaplan? It was that uh, you look at the period map. Then uh, this is complex analytic. Uh, inside you take this D prime mod gamma prime and you take the prime image. And the claim was that this guy is algebraic. Okay, so now uh, the two uh, lines proof is Okay, this guy is complex analytic in D mod gamma, so the pre image is complex analytic there, no problem. Now, by uh, the definable structure that I have put here, this guy is definable there. But now this map has been proven to be definable. This was the main theorem I started with today. I finished yesterday. So the pre image is also definable. So it is definable, complex analytic. So I apply O minimal chow, it is algebraic. Or even don't write it. Just read it on the diagram. 
Okay, so uh, for the rest of these lectures now, I really need uh, a, a precise definition. Yeah. Yeah, so the pre-image of something definable. So that guy is even R alge definable there. So the pre-image will be R and X definable. R and X is an O minimal structure. Okay. So yeah, yeah everything is on R and X. I'm not precising what is the structure, but here everything is on R and X. Okay, so uh, the definition that I will uh, need is uh, what I call a special subvariety. So a special subvariety will be one component of the Hodge locus, or more precisely, a special subvariety of S for V is uh, some guy of the form uh, phi minus one of what? Well, I want to take uh, a guy of the form dy mod gamma y, uh, and pre image of this, and one uh, irreducible component where uh, gy dy is the generic memforted group on y. Okay. So, so this is so the, the Hodge locus will be the union of uh, special subvarieties. And uh, equivalently, what you can prove, which is rather nice, is that uh, Y, an irreducible uh, algebraic subvariety of S, is special. It is equivalent to saying that it is maximal among the Z's. Uh, in uh, S irreducible with the same imported group as Y. Sure. No, actually, it's stronger. <laughs> This stronger because, uh, uh, well, I have to, I would have to check again, but uh, in Catani de King Kaplan, uh, what we prove actually is that this is algebraic. Why they restrict themselves to an irreducible component of that? So, actually, you see, I mean, you are, it's just a complex analytic map. So, this being complex analytic could have infinitely many irreducible components. So I never checked if you can deduce that from uh, their approach. I mean, I would have to, probably you can, but. Uh, so let's say it's really equivalent <laughs> for simplicity. Um, other questions? Okay, so let me mention, although I will not uh, use it later, but this is a nice result, so let me uh, mention it here. Um, out of this definability uh, business with more, uh, much more work actually. So you need to, uh, to uh, prove not only O minimal chow, but a, a version uh, that you can call O minimal gaga, but I will not enter into this, but you have the following nice result uh, by Becker, Johan, and Zimmerman, which is an old conjecture of Griffiths that tells you that so it describes even more uh, precisely how close you are of being algebraic. Another way of seeing this result is telling you that basically if you allow singularities, then you can imagine that any period map is actually immersive. So namely, uh, it tells you the following. So suppose you have a period map, then actually uh, there exists a factorization, which is absolutely canonical. Um, where uh, S to T uh, is dominant and T is quasi-projective. Okay, so it tells you that you can really uh, factorize this period map to something where, uh, so basically the image, if you prefer to say it that way, the image as a canonical algebraic structure. All right, so this finishes the lecture of yesterday. Questions? No? 
All right, so uh, let's move uh, into an apparently different direction, although actually it's not so different. So I talked about tame geometry. Now I want to talk about uh, functional transcendence. And actually, uh, this point of view already appeared uh, uh, in my first lecture, I think, and in Javier's lecture yesterday. Namely, we characterize, uh, Javier characterized the CM points uh, in the uh, upper half plane as being uh, the points with rational coordinates such that when you apply the Jane variant, uh, they still have Q bar uh, values. So, which is a functional, uh, fun uh, which is a, a transcendent statement. Okay. So, uh, so lecture three starts now. So, this is Hodge theory and functional transcendence. All right. So, what is the idea? The idea, well, we look again at uh, our period map. But uh, now, uh, so here we have the period map, but actually I will not be so interested uh, in the period map itself. I rather think at the following diagram, I take the universal cover and here I have this uh, diagram, okay? And now what is important for me is that I remember that uh, D is uh, open, actually semi-algebraic inside D check, which is algebraic, okay? So if I look at this diagram, and if you come from complex algebraic geometry, uh, you can think that actually period maps are some kind of emulation of an algebraic structure on the universal cover of algebraic varieties. Because you see what you are trying to say is that if you are lucky, this map is an immersion. And so actually uh, you are modeling uh, the universal cover on this algebraic variety, more or less. Okay, so... Uh, we look at this, phi tilde. As an emulation of an algebraic structure. On the universal cover of SN. You see, uh, one of the big problem in complex algebraic geometry is that Okay, the universal cover, you quit the category of algebraic varieties, you necessarily go to a complex analytic space as soon as the fundamental group is infinite. It's very rare that the universal cover is an algebraic variety. Of course, you have the case of Fubinian varieties, but other than that, there are not so many. So the idea is that nevertheless, uh, we would like to see some algebraicity and period maps in some sense give you that. So more precisely, now the idea is the following. You want to compare the algebraic structure here and the algebraic structure on S. And this comparison has to be complicated because you go through the universal cover and this map is very far from being algebraic, whatever you do, as soon as the fund fundamental group is infinite. So I will define what is an algebraic variety of the universal cover. I define uh, Y, complex analytic irreducible, um, in SN is an algebraic subvariety of, of uh, SN tilde um, for the period map. So of course, uh, uh, this definition will depend on the period map you choose. So for phi, if y, is of the form phi minus one of uh, something algebraic and the something algebraic can be taken as being the Zariski closure of the image. This is the smallest guy. Uh, so this guy being taken inside a D check. Okay. So in other words, uh, something will be algebraic there if it is the pre-image of something al algebraic here. And I also want it to be irreducible. And now, if you do this uh, definition, the natural qu question becomes, take something algebraic there. What can I say about the projection of that thing? And in particular, are there cases where uh, the image is also algebraic? So uh, I will say that uh, Y in SN tilde, respectively, W in SN 
um, arba algebraic for uh, phi if y and phi of y are algebraic, respectively w and one irreducible component equivalently any of them. algebraic okay so a guy here is bi-algebraic if it is algebraic in the sense of the previous definition and the projection is algebraic and a guy here is bi-algebraic if it is algebraic and the frame image in the universal cover is algebraic at least one irreducible component So actually, this is kind of a, a very, very general uh, format. I do not have, I can formalize this a bit. I do not have to take a period map. I could imagine that I have any uh, holomorphic uh, map into the identification of some algebraic space and make the same definition. So uh, let me play this game in simpler example, and then I can state the theorem. So suppose, so this generalizes the following picture. I would replace this picture by, let's say you take C star to the n, then uh, the universal cover of this is of course C to the n. And here the map that I would take would just be the identity. So in this very particular case, what happens is that the universal cover is already algebraic, okay? I could also do that with abelian varieties. So A is an abelian variety. I uniformize it. The universal cover is C to the n. And here again, this is the identity. Okay. Then you can try to uh, play that game and uh, identify what are the bi-algebraic subvarieties. So now you are looking for a subvariety of this torus, which is algebraic, such that when I put it back to the universal cover, it is still algebraic. And then it's very easy to see that you have only translate of subtori. If you do the same game here, you get translate of a bin sub varieties. So what is remarkable here is that by this kind of uh, bi-algebraic bi bi format, basically you recover, this is equivalent to understanding the group structure. Now you can play the same game with uh, uh, Shimura uh, varieties, where here it's a bit more interesting. So a Shimura variety is a very special case, as I said, of uh, 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 a period domain when it is algebraic. So you take a Shimura variety. So its identification is of the form D mod gamma. Here, the universal cover is the bounded symmetric domain D. And here, the map now is not the identity, but this is an open immersion into D check. Okay. And then you can ask what are the bi-algebraic uh, sub varieties in that case, maybe. And more generally, finally, you go to uh, general period maps there. So this is really the picture that you have to have in mind. And this is the way the, this theory uh, developed. Okay, and the answer is that in the same way as uh, here, uh, the bi-algebraic format recovered the group structure. Here, basically, you recover also the group structure and Hecker correspondences. In the following sense, so uh, I need a small generalization of uh, the special sub varieties. So, uh, namely, the notion of weakly special. So, a weakly special uh, sub variety of uh, now D mod gamma, which is any Hodge variety, not necessarily of Shimura type. Uh, is uh, something of the form uh, either a special one or a bit more general, something of the following form. You suppose that you have a special sub variety which is of the form a product. 
So this weekly special business will take care of product structure. Namely, you have dH mod gamma H and you have dL mod gamma L inside d mod gamma. All this embedded using group theory, of course. And uh, a weekly special is something of the form uh, dH mod gamma H cross a generic point here. So where uh, T uh, belongs to DL mod gamma L is hot generic. Namely, it's a Mumforted group is the generic Mumforted group here. So uh, this is the definition of a weekly special uh, subvariety in the model. And now uh, a weekly special subvariety in S in this setting. So a weekly special subvariety of S is just phi minus one of weekly special in D mod gamma. And you take an irreducible component, complex analytic irreducible component. Okay. So now uh, the theorem, which generalizes those results about bi-algebraic subvarieties. So the theorem is the following. So this is due to Moon and, and the way I will state it plus uh, Ulmo Yapaev uh, for Shimura varieties. And then this is due to uh, myself uh, with Odinovska. In general, uh, for variation of a structure. So you have your period map. And it says the following that the bi-algebraic subvarieties for phi are precisely the weekly special ones. So this is the first point. In particular, uh, the weekly special are algebraic. They are bi-algebraic. In particular, they are algebraic, so it contains uh, so it's the same result of Catani doing Kaplan, but for phi minus one of weekly special rather than phi minus one of special. And uh, there are also, so you have a nice characterization as the one you had for special subvarieties as being uh, the maximal one for a given Mumforted group. There are the maximal ones for a given monodromy group, algebraic monodromy group. There are also uh, the closed irreducible uh, Subvarieties of S, uh, maximal with a given uh, Mumforted group, uh, um, algebraic monodromy group with a given algebraic monodromy group. Okay. So now you can ask that's nice. Is there such a characterization of special subvarieties? Well, in the Shimura case, yes, in the sense that, uh, but you need more than functional transcendence. You actually need uh, true transcendence. And these are the, these are the weekly special containing uh, one Q bar points, one special point. Um, uh, in general, it's not known. Okay, so uh, now what I want to do is that uh, this is nice, but of course, this is just a characterization. Now you want stronger uh, results. So what is the functional uh, transcendence about? Uh, well, this is the Axel-Lindemann uh, principle. So the geometry of such a bi-algebraic uh, format actually for, follows a very strict heuristic. And the, the heuristic is called uh, Axel-Lindemann and Axel-Lindemann is easier to understand. So I first uh, state that one. So suppose uh, that you are in this situation of bi-algebraic geometry. Namely, you have a map from the universal cover to some identification of something complex algebraic, which is equivalent under pi one of S and, and uh, you are here, okay? Now uh, take something 
uh, what is the heuristic of the X uh, Lindemann uh, principle is that uh, if you take Y inside uh, S and tilde uh, algebraic, so the pre image of something algebraic here and taking irreducible component, then uh, you take its image. So in general, it is not algebraic. It is algebraic if Y was already bi algebraic. But uh, you take the Zariski closure of this thing, and the claim is it is bi is bi algebraic. So this is the heuristic. So example, you take something algebraic in C n. So I, I take I come back to the example of the torus. Take something algebraic here. Take the exponential. You, know, you can normalize by putting two pi i if you want. Take the Zariski closure. So and the result is that thing has to be a subtorus translated. It's by algebraic, so a translate of a subtorus. Same thing if you take an abelian variety. Phi of y, czar, is a translate of a subtorus of a subabelian variety. Subabelian variety. So, in particular, if uh, A is simple, uh, you are the ice dense automatically as soon as you are not a point. Yeah, everything is positive dimensional. Okay. Um, all right, and so uh, of course, in the case of Shimura varieties, it gives you uh, the following. So, so all these results are due to X. It was prov proven using differential algebra. So this is from the seventies. Um, then uh, example three, which is uh, the, so for Shimura varieties, it was proven by Pila for uh, y one of n. Then there is, this is due to Ulmo and Yefaf for projective Shimura varieties. Then uh, Pila and Simmerman for Ag and uh, uh, myself uh, Ulmo and Yefaf. For general Shimura variety, uh, it tells you the following. So you are in this situation where you have a Shimura variety. So and now uh, this is a bit more complicated because D is not algebraic, but it is semi-algebraic inside a D check, which is an algebraic variety, so a flag variety actually. And uh, so now uh, you take something algebraic in D, which means you just take the intersection, an irreducible component of an intersection of D with something algebraic in this flag variety. And then uh, it tells you that uh, the projection, when you take the RC closure, it has to be weakly special. So it really looks like a uh, Shimura sub variety up to uh, Eker translation and up to uh, the fact that there is this product subtlety. Um, okay, so I'm late. Uh, this uh, axiom domain uh, statement, I think is kind of easily understandable. It's kind of nice. You have something algebraic upstairs, you pull, push down uh, and you take the ASCII closure. You can identify what it is. Actually, there is a much uh, stronger uh, functional transcendent statement, which is called X general, uh, but uh, it's more complicated and I want to take a bit of time to explain it. So uh, I guess I will stop here and finish that tomorrow. Okay. Questions?
Uh, yeah, maybe it's a bit late, but I didn't quite understand the definition of weekly special. Can you? Yeah, uh, did I? Uh, yeah, it's late because I erased it. So uh, basically, uh, when you have this D mod gamma, uh, the, uh, 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 the special subvarieties in D mod gamma are defined. You take uh, uh, a subgroup of your group defining D, which is also a Mumforte group uh, for some generic Mumforte group for some period domain D prime inside D. Then you get d prime mod gamma prime, and this will define a special subvariety. Okay, but now it can happen that this d prime mod gamma prime can be decomposed as a product. It's not necessarily simple, right? For instance, uh, the group g prime defined it can be g one times g two, and basically d prime mod gamma prime will be up to a finite quotient uh, business. It will be of the form d one mod gamma one cross d two mod gamma two, and it's clear that there is still some hom homogeneity in d one cross gamma one cross a point. So a weekly special is exactly a guy of that form. You take, you have this product, you just take one fiber, but one fiber passing through a hot generic point. So that you see it has any point in a weekly special as the same Mumforte group as all the points in D prime mod gamma prime, uh, if they are hot generic on the first factor, but the monodromy is smaller. It will be only on the first factor. So this is really, all this is related to this business of comparing comparing the algebraic monodromy group to the Mumforte group, you know that this is a normal subgroup. So when you go to the adjoint group, this is a factor. So what I'm looking at here are really uh, subvarieties where the monodromy group is not the full Mumforte group, but just a factor. Okay. Is that clear? Uh, yeah. What do you mean by hot generic? Hot generic, I mean that each point on those domains, they parameterize, they have a hot structure ab above, right? There is a variation uh, in there is a and I'm asking that the Mumforte group at that point is the one generic on D prime. Okay, more questions? You said this principle is heuristic. So if you mean- Yeah, it's some kind of guide. Uh, namely, uh, I think this, this picture emerged because uh, we realized what was happening for uh, Tori and uh, and then for uh, Abelian varieties, and uh, you can you could state a stupid conjecture, which will obviously you will find counter example. But I'm just saying that in interesting geometric situation, it's a good guide to keep in mind. This is what I mean by heuristic. It's not very precise. It's just that this is a nice idea. Uh, you have a situation where, in some sense, you force some algebraicity or you, or you have a way to define some algebraic property on the universal cover. And then you try to compare uh, the algebraic structure on the universal cover with the algebraic structure on the variety you started with. And then this heuristic may or may not apply, but at least you can try and have a look at it. And actually it applies for, va for variations of structures, which is kind of amazing. Are there questions? So if not, we can thank Bruno again. Okay, so let's conclude the morning with a second talk by uh, Jochen of his lecture series. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so so even, if, I mean, maybe this is just pandemic related, but even for me, it's hard to switch gears for the third kind of topic this morning. <laughs> these nice lectures but let's let's try and uh, let's hope i i can catch up with some time so so let me recall what i told you last time so where were we so i told you a little bit about this um last time i i introduced for you this moduli space of this dobo moduli space and for the um, so this were so we fixed some curve, maybe of the complex numbers or the smooth projective, and this Dolbo modular space. Uh, or vector bundle and phi is uh, was a section so 
good. Uh, rank n degree d and what this, um, this, this was homeomorphic or in this case it's smooth. I could write diffeomorphic to a representation variety. Where I also twisted this thing. So this was an affine explicit variety somehow. And um, this miraculous P equals W conjecture was <clears throat> relating the Hodge filtration, the Hodge structure you find on this representation variety to some, uh, to this perverse filtration, which comes from the geometry of this space. And I didn't really tell you what the perverse filtration is yet. And um, because we already had two intense talks this morning, I will not tell you talk about the perverse filtration this morning, but I want to start by just telling you what we know about the, the weight filtration on the right hand side, what we know about this cohomology. And this is actually um, the only things we know that will go into, that are, as far as I understand, going into this proof. So today I will just kind of talk about what we know, some things we know. This hot structure on embedding. This was embedded. And even the things we know about the cohomology of Mbeti, they, they are usually, I mean, the, the proofs for these usually take a serious amount of things that you actually know on the left-hand side to transport it over there. And so there's the, and some, some, some variants. So it's, um, yes. So, um, so the, the key, key thing we, we know for these and for some, and so the, okay, let me maybe first try to formulate a clear statement. So the first thing we know is that the, we know multiplicative generators for this cohomology ring, and they are actually easy to describe, and I will try to write it out. You take, well, this is a moduli space of bundles with some structure. So if things are going well, there will be a universal bundle on this moduli space times the curve. And from this, the only cohomology classes you might see how to construct here is, well, you take the churn classes of this universal bundle, take the Kunit components, you get elements here. Yes? So this was the space of matrices. That's the product of the commutators was, well, if the D was zero, this was one and otherwise you put a root of unity here. And that's the D. Right, and so the, I want, so the, these Kunit components are multiplicative generators. And this is, and so I want to explain why this this is true. And so I want to tell you three things. And I say just right now. So these Kunit components generate this cohomology ring. We know what their Hodge rates are here. And actually their Hodge rates here differ from the Hodge rates you say here, uh, seriously. Um, so we know where they sit in the Hodge structure here. And um, the whole, this, proves as I understand them so far, they will go through telling you that this moduli space is actually, um, this has many variants and lots of these variants are kind of more convenient to work with. Um, they are geometrically more pleasant. These lots of these variants that you have here, unfortunately do not have their Betty counterpart. 
But since we know the generators on the left hand side, we know how to put them in the Hodge weights they should have here. We can formulate a P equals W conjecture, even if there's no W filtration available. So even if there's no Betty space available. And that's how these arguments go. So you want to prove this. So you take your generators, um, number them by which Hodge rate they are, and then you transfer them to a geometrically more pleasant situation and then try to argue there. And so today is just about these generators, about the smoothness and so background on these things. These are kind of classical arguments, but I like them. And because there's some variants, these variants appear, I think it's a good opportunity to, um, to get back to this, these old results. So the aim is, so aim is generators. or the cohomology and their, their Hodge, Hodge waves. And so let's start with something. Oh. How to go. So, and there's a very classical argument on how to prove that these are often generated by universal classes, which goes back to Bouville and then to Markman. And I want to recall this and to recall this, I, I need a, yes, so some, some recollections. So the, the first thing I need to know is, is that these varieties are actually smooth. So, um, so if you just take, so, let, so the vector bundles. on C of rank N and degree D. And if you if you like, you can put, a, put in some stable here. I don't really care so much. Or you think of the stack if you, if you like stacks. Then there's the notion of the tangent. So if you pick one, so how do you prove that the space is smooth? Well, you compute its tangent space and variety is smooth. Well, you compute the tangent space and show that it's of the same dimension at every point and smooth. So you need to compute the tangent space of this one at some, some point E. And what turns out is that this is the H1 of C with values in the endomorphisms of E. And if you're a stacky person, then, well, I'm in Pisa, so I have to, but you, you're free to ignore. Um, um, this is essentially this H1 and the, the tangent space, if you take a Higgs bundle to this Higgs, then you get the first cohomology of some small complex. Where he, you take the, the maps, the commutator with your Higgs. Higgs field. And again, if you're in Pisa, you want to put a, the H zero here. So I want you to to remind. Maybe maybe it's good to to recall why this is true, right? Maybe that's a. I mean, there's many ways to see this, but sort of maybe why. A short reminder. So, for an algebraic job, for me, I mean, the tangent space, the points of the tangent space of any variety are sort of the, the maps. So, are the, the K joint? We should. The, are the solution, I mean, Okay. Where I, where I, where, k epsilon valued points where epsilon square is zero. 
So this is, I mean, I, I hope you know. I mean, this is, I mean, at first this seems like an, a very abstract and strange definition in terms of schemes, but if you think about it, it's actually what the tension space is, right? You look at poly solutions of polynomial equations and you look at first order um, deformations of them. And if you just spell out the definitions, you get this. It's just that it takes a while to do this. So now, now, okay, so how to compute on this bundle space? So how to compute this? So what's a vector bundle? Um, well, cover C by some, some open, open affine part, such that E restricted to UI is trivial, so that this E will be given by some gluing, gluing functions in GLN of UI, or so maybe I should put O of UI, J. Uh, uij is the intersection of u and i as usual and the good thing you know because of infinitesimal lifting things is that if you have this if you had any thickening of your bundle over k joint epsilon modular epsilon squared then it would still be trivial on these open covers so so your task to to get such a deformation is just to lift this so you want to replace this, so um, so deform over C times epsilon modular epsilon square is the same as to choose Gij tilde in GLN of OU and epsilon modular epsilon squared, but this is nothing nothing so nothing very complicated so you could just take your old element and you add to it something that lies in epsilon times this thing so this is nothing complicated it's just you add some matrix that's it so where this matrix is in in the matrices so the Lie algebra of this thing if you want to okay so then but you want this to be a co-cycle, so apparently there's an obstruction to having co having such an extension that uh, this is a co-cycle. If you compute what the obstruction is to this being a co-cycle, gives you an element in H2 of C with values in this endomorphisms of E which is fortunately zero because we are over a one dimensional base. And then the possible solutions are, well, those which are, which do give you a co-cycle. And then you see, I mean, if you compute the co-cycle, if you, if you conjugate, if you multiply two such elements together, you see that these matrices always get multiplied. This is co-cycle in GIJ, which is why you get a class in H1 of this end if you spell it out. So this is so this is why the, you get this tangent space correspond to H1 of C, the endomorphisms, and the H0 of the endomorphisms is just well, it's the tangent space to the automorphism groups of your bundle. Um, now this is, and now if you do the same for Higgs bundles. You would just say, well, you do the same thing. You trivialize your bundle, then you get GIJs, your gluing co-cycle, and you will get a phi inside of the matrices. Sort of it's matrices n by n with values in omega. Right, that's what would you get from the phi, and then this compatibility. So you want to have your gluing co-cycle, you want to lift your phi, and you want to have these compatible with the gluing structure. And this tells you why you get a, this complex. So it's just a little bit of homological algebra, and I just wanted to say it for once, in order to uh, so that you can. Yeah, this is not not something deep, but it's. Um, an, an important computation maybe to do once. So now what's the good thing? So if you have a, the only thing about stable bundles I will use, so stable implies 
that the automorphisms are just C star. So that's a fact that is not deep, but because I don't want to talk about stability, that's the only thing I need. So now I told you that the H0 is the tangent space to the automorphisms of my bundle. So this H0 always has the same dimension. I know that H1 minus H0, is, so the Euler characteristic is constant in families. So the dimension of H1 will be constant, right? Good. So now for Higgs bundles, we are in trouble because we have a complex. We take the H1 of a complex and we should look at H2 of this thing. Uh, so this could have an H2 and it actually does a lot of times, but there's something um, nice about this. For Higgs, there's a problem. This is that the, the Euler characteristic of this complex is constant, but there's an H2. Could could mess with the die could could jump. That would be bad. So we have to look at this complex one more time. So, but there's, there's a nice feature, and this is something that people knew. <laughs> it's a new before he started this, I guess. So this is self-dual is is self-dual. With respect to sad duality. So you dualize tensor with omega and shift. Right? Because if you take the dual and ten, if you take the dual of this, the map goes in the other direction, you get an omega dual, but then sad duality tells you to tensor with omega, and then suddenly you got the omega on the other side. And if you compute even the map, it's just a dual map. So that, that's nice. So this this uh, this is a self dual, but aha! So we knew the H zero was just the automorphisms, which is C star. So the H two will also be C star. So we were lucky. This tells you something interesting, because for the for the moduli space of bundles, if you consider it as an algebraic stack, the dimension of the tangent space is constant because the Euler characteristic is constant. If you do the same thing for the Higgs bundle moduli space, you see that the by the self-duality, the H2 jumps exactly at these points where the H0 jumps. But this means that the H1 minus H0 will jump. So this stack will also be singular exactly at those points that have too many automorphisms. Um, good. Was there a question? Okay, good. So this is nice. Um, so uh, this this is why this is smooth. So I should right away maybe um, maybe here is a point to put some remark. So the situation, if we replace omega by so I in H zero C and E tensor omega, if we wouldn't consider omega, but would look at something tensor omega for some effective divisor D, some effective divisor. Then you could use the same argument and use set duality again to show that the H2 actually vanishes at stable bundles. So then you get it vanishing 
of H2. Right, so because you, you in, in the dual situation, you would get an H0 of something with minus D, which is then away. Okay, th so this would be a, a more pleasant situation somehow to go to, and at some point we will. Okay, so what, how is this related? This useful related generators. Um, apparently not at all, but well, it is. And, and this is this beautiful observation by Bovill and Markman. This is due to Bovill and Markman. And Bovill himself, when he, he writes that he was motivated by an argument of that appeared by Ellingsruth and Ströme for Hilbert schemes of points on a surface. Um, and he realized that it, you could use it for moduli space of bundles. So the basic observation is that if you have X a smooth projective variety, well, just a compact smooth orientable manifold would be enough then something that has Poincaré duality, then you have the class of the diagonal in the cohomology of the product. So it's in the middle, so say dimension N. So then that sits in the middle dimension. So it's the direct sum of HI of X and the H, uh, 2n minus i of x. You can write this, this class and the, the, its current components. You can actually write it down. It's, it's the sum where the alpha i run over alpha by an orthonormal uh, basis for well, hi that is orthogonal. With respect to to, to the uh, Poincaré duality to intersection pairing, to cup product pairing. So that's um, um, yeah. So that's uh, so I that's an argument from that I learned in my topology class, I think, algebraic topology. Yes, that's right. That's the that's the, the the one way to say this is the diagonal. I mean, so yeah, okay. So diagonal induces the identity in cohomology, and if you spell out what this means in as a correspondence, it's the identity in cohomology. If you spell it out, what this means, this gives you this. But this gives you the simple uh, statement that the Kunert components of the diagonal generate the cohomology. Well, they generate because they are a base. So the Kunert components. generate H star. Well, not even multiplicatively, even additively. Okay, so what's this good for in our situation? So let's first look at the modular space of bundles itself. So let's look at one and the stable, and we put this co-primeness assumption. So this co-primeness assumption is, yes, is made to make semi-stable and stable the same. So this will be a um, smooth pro proper variety, and so I took the so this was supposed to be the Poincaré dual class. So I should put two n minus i. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so it's um, ah. So the index i was uh, badly. Um, uh, yes. So should I put i k, i k something like this? So I right. So I'm sorry. I didn't. Okay. I when I'm writing this formula, I forgot that this was index appeared here. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Right. So this was confusing. 
So this is actually smooth projective. And then we will observe the following. So, so you have a, and there exists a universal bundle. times the curve. Now, now now so what what this argument is about is telling is saying, well, if we want to prove that these churn classes generate the cohomology, we have to, it would suffice to prove that the class of the diagonal, uh, that we can express the class of the diagonal in terms of these term classes. And this is possible by this deformation theory argument that we just saw. So look at, times your curve and project down to bun. So on this case space, you have the bundle of homomorphisms from, well, you take the universal bundle on these components. Did I call it, give it a name, let's call it E universal. And the universal bundle on these components. And then push it forward. Of this thing. So this is because these fibers are one dimensional curves, you can express it as a complex of vector bundles represented And I mean, you can either apply general theorems to, to prove this, or in this case, because you're on a curve, you could just try to figure out your own presentation, it would not be hard. Um, write some uh, complex of vector bundles that universally computes the cohomology of the fibers, such that whenever you restrict this thing to any point, E1, E2, and take the cohomology, then this is actually the cohomology of C with values in HOM E1, E2. Aha, uh -huh. so this tells you that, uh, but if these are stable bundles, any morphism between stable bundles has to be an isomorphism. So if so, this will only have H zero on the diagonal. So it has only so so H zero is hom e one e two, and this is non zero if e one is actually isomorphic to e two. So is supported on the diagonal. Uh huh. So then. So actually, so this tells you that this, if you write this complex D, so then if you do a careful computation of this, you will get that the degeneracy, the first degeneracy locus, or the only one, the, the first degeneracy locus of this map D is actually the diagonal. So the degeneracy locus is the, the, the locus where the rank of this thing goes down by one. And then, uh, you compute and you know the Euler characteristic and has expected co-dimension because if you want to compute the Euler characteristic of this complex, well, it is the same computation that we did for the complex of the tangent space. So it has the expected co-dimension. And so there's the Tom Portis formula. that says that the class of the diagonal 
is uh, is the 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 is, is the churn class of this complex of the correct dimension. So and somehow um, but now Riemann Brock tells us so this, this but this was the RP lower star of home. And so Riemann Roch tells us that we can compute the, the churn class, the churn character of this push forward by the churn character upstairs. And upstairs, we just had a product of universal bundles. So this can be expressed in the universal classes. Riemann Roch tells us this can be expressed in terms of the universal of the churn classes of the of the bundle home that I started with and this is uh, expressed in terms of the CI of the universal so that's how you get this result that the corollary of this is that indeed the cohomology of this bundle space is generated by the Kunit components of the churn classes of the universal bundle. It's quite a beautiful argument, so I wanted to say this. So let me write it down and then see where this leads us for Higgs bundles. Time is running fast. So this corollary. So the is generated by the Kunit components of the churn classes of the universal bundle. And um, maybe there's one thing to, to note. So I, I'm, I'm intentionally vague about whether I mean the projective variety or the stack. And the algebraic stack is the, in this case, is the projective variety times BGM, or classifying space for line bundles, so CP infinity somehow. And Sort of they will differ in cohomology by one free generator. And this is the extra generator that you would get from the C1 here. So the statement is true somehow both for the stack and for the good moduli space, depending on what you like. Um, right. So Markman explained that this also applies to Higgs bundles. This works for Higgs. And there's two issues, two problems. The first one is that this, uh, this X and Y stable is not proper. And the second one is this r pi lower star gives us a complex of length two. Mm. So how to deal with these two issues? So here, sort of the, the second issue for our le my lecture series, there's two ways to go about. There's the lazy way to go about. So the lazy solution would be to say, well, go to, to replace omega by omega twisted by some effective divisor. And then I told you that the V2 will vanish and we are back in business. 
then V2 vanishes. Right, this is and symmetric. Ah, yeah, so I, I should have said this before somehow. This, this third duality thing is actually the thing that, um, so one way to think about this moduli space of fixed bundles is as the cotangent to the moduli space of bundles, which is supposed to have a symplectic form. And so that's what you get. So this was symmetric. And Markman has a, theor has a general theorem that if the degeneracy, if you have it given, if your thing is given by such a complex such that the degeneracy locus of this is the diagonal, and it's self-dual, so I'm cheating. He has a stronger statement, but um, <laughs> I don't want to formulate it. So, and it's self-dual, then if you take the, the, the correct churn class of this thing, you will get the class, the cycle class of the diagonal if the dimension of your space is even, and otherwise you get zero. Luckily, this is even dimensionally, so we get the diagonal class. But this, this either the diagonal or zero tells you that there's a non-trivial non computation that you have to do. Yeah, and so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful argument, but um, not for today. So this is how this goes. So this, no, I said it, how this goes in two. And the other thing is, how do we get rid of this non-properness? And there's a, uh, maybe I can also say this. So what, how, what do you do about this non-properness? Well, um, he uses a, a nice compactification of this. So work on, on some nice compactification that it's a bit hard to explain because I haven't explained about Higgs, enough about Higgs bundles. So he, you can view a Higgs bundle as a coherent sheaf on a surface, and then you pass through the corresponding moduli of sheaves on the complete surface, and you will get, um, you can run the same argument on this product to get the class of the diagonal of this compactified guy space with the original thing and the diagonal is luckily a closed sub variety here and then this will give you if you think about this will give you if this will give you that the the same argument will give you that the churn classes of the universal bundle generate for you the pure part of this cohomology because the pure classes are those that i can see from the compactification but then we are lucky because we, the, we know for the other reason that I mentioned at the end of the last lecture that this actually has only pure classes, so we are safe. So that's, that's the idea of this argument. So maybe should I write something for this? I mean, we are... No, no, so no, for no, um, no, he uses a different one because you you need to, to be able to have one where you can have this home complex there. So you, you need to describe it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's more convenient to describe a compact, use a compactification that you can also describe as a moduli space of certain bundles. And this is what he does. And I will explain, come, this will reappear um, hopefully next, next time. And then he officially uses Tamash compactification to show degeneration, but you can shorten this argument by the saying that you only get the pure classes and you know that this is pure cohomology only. So this is the first thing that I wanted to say. So the upshot is, so, yes. Um, no. And so the, the only thing, I mean, right. So for no, you, you don't really need properness um, because it's just a statement of the cycle classes. The problem, if you have something very non-proper, then the statement about the cycle class may be not so interesting because it might just be zero. So, and so you need, you need at least to compactify one of the two factors to, I mean, you, you see in this description of the diagonal here, right? So if you, 
if you if you would take a, something compact, I mean, this this thing has only cohomology up to half of the dimension. So if you just take this diagonal class and restrict it to Higgs times Higgs, it's just zero, because on each of these factors, one of the two has two large cohomological degree. What survives is those in the lower degrees. And so that's why you need the compactification on the other side to make sure that these survive. And you have to, to be a bit more careful because on this compactification, it's not immediately clear that you can arrange it to be a smooth compactification. And so you have to uh, um, turn on the, the working machine, but it's not, I mean, it's, you have to turn out the, 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 some yoga, but it's not something where, where I guess Mark one was, um, this is not this just cost him a page and not much uh, worry it's good so the, the upshot is here in the same holes for x and d and even if we replace omega by omega to the d which is nice and there's one last oh, now i can hardly do this, uh, but I wanted to mention it, at least in this vector bundle situation. Maybe it, maybe I should leave it to the lecture notes. There's one further generalization. is that you can also use um, what's called parabolic bundles. Also use so vector bundles together with a flag of subspaces at some points. There's also some stability notion. And then you have the homomorphisms that respect the filtration. These are the kernel of the homomorphisms. Two. So the homomorphisms of the fibers divided by the filtered homomorphisms. And so you can run the same homological argument for this thing. And then in the end, you will want to say, okay, now I can express everything in terms of the churn classes of this thing. And so this you can express in terms of the churn classes of these two bundles and the churn classes that come from the universal bundles that come from the sub quotients of this filtration. So this need the CI of the universal bundles plus the churn classes of the bundles corresponding to this VI module VI minus one. But otherwise the argument is just the same. That's an excursion that's just for technical reasons later. Maybe if you want to look at the, these, these proofs, then this now may show up. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to mention is that we can actually compute the Hodge weights on the Betty side of this thing. Right. So I should write down more maybe, but... So you can also force me to write down more by just shouting. It will be a bit slower then. So and there's an argument. So now what about? The Hodge way, the Hodge weight.
of these classes on this representation variety. And there's a, I guess this is, so I don't, don't exactly know the story. So for the, for, for, for small ranks, this was known before, but then Vivek Schender came up with a, with an amazing idea. And so this homeomorphism that you have it's sort of we we took the churn you take we take the churn we take Kundit components of the universal this universal bundle, but well this is so this exists so this is well on C times the representation variety. This also lives. But there, um, how should I say? So topologically, this lives there. And then he says, well, uh, this universal bundle on this representation variety can be viewed is a is a G bundle on a simplicial space. Right, so it's the it becomes a natural it gets a natural holomorphic structure if I if I use this if I just look at this as an abstract simplicial space so I can just use the so as a simplest on a simplicial complex so if I if you just triangulate your surface yeah. Octagons are hard. Then a representation of the fundamental group is just something that you get from this gluing thing from this triangulated thing. But then this can be this has can can be expressed as G bundle on a simplicial. scheme where the simplicial scheme is just well you take the points on each in each dimensions and you take the gluing i mean you just take your simplicial set and view it as a scheme by saying all oh, points appearing are just spec of c just points and there there, there the hodge structure of the simplicial scheme is of weight zero. It's just trivial because it's, it's only comes from spec of points. And so this tells you so from this it uses that the weight of a Kunit component of ci is actually equal to the weight of the ci so this is a rough sketch because i mean if i want to write down this formally it's it's a bit complicated but it's not really complicated because you i mean this representation variety had this explicit description in terms of matrices if you just write down the simplicial complex, the simplicial set that gives you your Riemann surface, 
view it as, as a scheme, visual scheme and spell out what a G bundle is on this thing, you just find this representation, get, get a morphism to this representation variety on the nose, which is a map on schemes. And then this follows. And this is amazing. And I want to maybe close with this. So, but this tells you, but the, hmm? Yes, so, yes, and uh, and of course, the, this thing of H of BG, BGLN, this is uh, the, the polynomial ring in the churn classes and has the Hodge structure of the universe, of the, well, infinite Grassmannian, if you want to. So this is, this, in some sense, he would like to say that these G bundles is maps from, from the simplicial scheme to BG. You have to make sense of this, but then the Hodge structure just comes from the cohomology of BG and here there's nothing, which is a kind of a beautiful argument once you convince you that it's actually true. What it's, what is interesting about this, this, this tells you, and this is, comes back to this magic of the last lecture. Well, if I take the, the ger second germ class, take its Kunit components, it gives me a class, the second germ class is a class in degree four. Now the curve has classes in degree zero, one, and two. So I will get classes in degree four, three, and two from this. Drop by one. These all are of the same weight. So in this point counting, so the, you have classes of degree two and odd and even degree. So this point counting argument of Tamas that I, and, and Rodriguez Villegas that I told you about, this will necessarily have cancellations because the weights appear in even and odd degrees and odd weights are counted with minus signs and even weights are with positive signs. This carries to this magic of guessing the formula from knowing the polynomial. Yeah, so it's only possible because you know a certain that your your guess should have a certain shape that makes it possible but still it's it's magic okay so that's what i wanted to say and so this is also the outlook i mean this definition of the weight is something that we can just use in all of these things even if there's no betty space and that's uh, that was go, goes into this proofs of this p equals w conjecture is that the essence is that Whatever the p-filtration is, if we could place the generators in the correct degrees of this p-filtration and prove that this is multiplicative, then we would be happy. Problem is that there is no reason at all, and as I will explain, to, to have the multiplicativity a priori. Because this, this filtration is built in a way that doesn't like cup products at all. <laughs> Okay, but that's all for today. Thank you. Questions? Okay, so if it's all clear, so thank you. Yeah, sorry, sorry, but the, the good thing is that I can advertise this. This was sort of an so the, the gear of the next lecture will again change somehow. So now this was just to import. We know that what the generators are, and we know something about the Hodge weights. And then the next lecture will use different geometry. Okay, so thank you very much.